Two weeks ago, you remember, we saw how we normally reacted to two situations. Remember the situation that I described where we're used to seven hours sleep and one night we go to bed late and we get up in the morning having had only five and a half hours sleep. And so we kind of remember the way we used to react in that situation, how our bodies were tired and our emotions were ragged. And so we look forward to that day, kind of expecting it to be like that for us. And we almost provide for sin. We almost expect to get irritable before the day is out. And uh, above all, we expect everybody to be a little more considerate of us that day, because they must know that we have bravely made do on only five and a half or six hours sleep. And they should consider that and take that into consideration and extend to us special privileges. And so you know what happens. Before that day is out, you have lost your temper uh, 10 or 11 times and uh, you just come back at the end of the day worn out, absolutely. Or you remember the other situation we described where you come home and your roommate or your wife or your husband is lying flat out watching TV and you have uh, faithfully and courageously prepared the supper for the previous four nights in a row and you ask them to help you and they don't move an inch. They just lie there watching the TV. And you know how the old sin rises up inside you and the old body gathers itself for a show of indignation and it pumps the blood into the veins madly and gets all the adrenaline circling the old acid round in the stomach and then you burst out in indignation and tell them how much you've done and how they should help today and you've been doing it for four nights now. And you let go a stream of language that settles this course of that evening and the course of the next seven or eight evenings that week. So, and you remember that we said that all that ceases when a supernatural power is released against that kind of self-centeredness that gets you into that situation. A supernatural power is released against that self-centeredness the moment you really believe that our old self was crucified with Christ. Now that, that old self, with all its rights to get irritable, with all its rights to get angry, with all its rights for people to treat it properly and fairly, all that old self was destroyed when Jesus submitted his own will and our wills on the cross to being maligned unjustly, insulted unjustly, judged unjustly and executed unjustly. And when that took place with Jesus, that took place to our old selves. And the moment we really believe that, there begins to be a deliverance from that old self-centeredness that we have. And you remember that we saw that that is made real in our own lives in inward victory when we begin to reckon upon it. When we begin to reckon that that's true. And uh, you remember that's in Romans 6 and 11, if you want to look at it. Romans 6 and 11. And that was some weeks ago where we saw that the way to actualize within us, inwardly, the victory over self and irritability and anger that has been wrought for us when Jesus died in, on Calvary is in our own attitude of reckoning or considering. It's page 981 in the black RSV, and Romans 6 and 11, so you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. So God destroyed you in Jesus, and you must consider yourselves dead in Jesus. And you remember too how we talked about the Greek word logizeste, and how it was the word that meant consider, and it meant that you were to set your mind on the past fact of your death with Jesus not on the present fact of your irritability and your bad temper and your anger. You weren't to look inside and say, I lost my temper again today, I must not be crucified. You were to look at the past fact that God said you were crucified with his son and you were to hold on to that through thick and thin. You remember we used the old uh, uh, water skiing illustration that you hold on even if all the facts seem to say that you're going to sink. And you put your mind on the past fact of your death with Jesus. That's part of what considering or reckoning means. 
It means that I regard myself as a man whose funeral took place 1900 years ago. And therefore a man who has no rights to these clothes and no rights to this car and no rights to these positions and no rights to have my way on earth. You set your mind on the past fact of Jesus' death and you set your will on the present fact of the rule of the Holy Spirit in your life. And those are the two parts of luggage this thing or considering. Reckoning yourself dead with Christ in the past and then submitting yourself absolutely to the present rule of the Holy Spirit in your life. And then as a result of that, God miraculously delivers you from things like anger and envy and jealousy, from unclean thoughts, from irritability and impatience, from all the things that portray self at its worst. And the Holy Spirit really does that. And you remember, we dealt with the second part of that considering last day. It was Romans 6 and 12. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal bodies to make you obey their passions. Submit to the Holy Spirit, really. Do not submit to sin, but submit to the Holy Spirit. You believe that you've been crucified with Christ, you believe in that past fact, and you submit to the present fact of the rule of the Holy Spirit in your life. So you let not sin therefore reign in your mortal bodies. You don't provide for sin. In the illustrations that we used, when you come uh, to the point where you haven't had enough hours sleep, you don't provide for sin. You say, Holy Spirit, you are well able this day, even though I still feel the sleep in my eyes, and I still feel the tiredness in my body, you are well able this day to fill me with the healthy, energetic life of Jesus. I receive it now. Lord Jesus, I'm going to live off you this day. I'm going to live off your patience this day because I have none myself. I'm going to live off your concentration this day because I have none myself. Or in the situation when you come home to the apartment or to the home and the friend won't help you, you look to the Holy Spirit, you look to Jesus and you say, Holy Spirit, will you bring me the patience of Jesus? Will you enable me to serve yet again and to be prepared to be a doormat if necessary in order to live in victory this day? And the Holy Spirit will give you that kind of thing. You do not provide for sin, but you provide really for the life of the Holy Spirit. Now, the the next verse, which is today's verse, really deals with the positive side of that submitting a little more. So there are two ways that we need to reckon ourselves. Consider ourselves dead with Christ in the past. Look at that past fact. And with our will, submit to the present fact of the Holy Spirit. Submit to the present fact of the Holy Spirit in two ways. Don't provide for sin. And today, bank on God's life coming through. Bank on God's life coming through. Don't provide for the old way you used to deal. Don't go into a situation saying, I know I'm going to lose my temper today. No. But bank on God's life coming through. And this is the positive side that we're going to talk about in this verse. You see it there in 13. Do not yield your members to sin as instruments of wickedness. But yield yourselves to God as men who have been brought from death to life and your members to God as instruments of righteousness. And that's all the positive side of banking on the baptism with the Holy Spirit. And unless you do that, you're left really with just a half consecration. Paul, first of all, points out that this is not the power of positive thinking. That the victory that comes from Jesus' death on the cross is not the power of positive thinking. It is not just the exertion of psychic forces to hold down and suppress emotions of anger and envy with emotions of patience and love. It is not just the power of positive thinking. And Paul goes out of his way to emphasize that again. That uh, all of us, I think, here have tried that kind of activity. We've tried this kind of, I'm all right, you're all right, business. And we've tried it, and it's exciting after you've read the book, and you kind of can work it for a week, and then the next week it isn't so good, and a month later you've forgotten the whole deal, and it just doesn't work. Or the kind of attitude and the power of positive thinking, think right and you'll be right. Think patient and you'll be patient. Think love and you'll be love. But I don't want to be patient, I don't want to be love. You see, And you try to think on top of your unwillingness. Now, Paul emphasizes that it is not the power of positive thinking that delivers us. That it is an actual power that is released from Jesus and that is released from God. And he emphasizes that the vital thing is the initial act of full consecration. Now, I'll show you how he emphasizes that, dear ones, if you look at it. 
even though you haven't the Greek there. Do you see 13, verse 13? It reads, Do not yield your members to sin as instruments of wickedness. Now, take my word for it, that the Greek there is a Greek uh, verb called paristaneta. And paristaneta is just don't yield. Stop yielding. Stop yielding. Stop this yielding that you're doing of your members to sin as instruments of wickedness. And then you see the word again, but yield yourselves. And the yield here is the same verb, but a different tense. And those of you who are Greek scholars will know that it's paristaceta, and it's the aorist tense. And it means yield now at a definite time. So Paul is saying, look, stop this yielding that you're doing from day to day. Stop doing all this yielding of your members to sin as instruments of wickedness. And at this point in time, yield yourselves to God. Now it is different, really don't. We don't in English have an aorist tense. But an aorist tense in Greek means you do it at a definite point in time. And... Uh, the International Critical Commentary, whom some of you from seminaries may know, even it's quite a liberal commentary in some ways, but it's reliable as far as the text goes. And he says, make a decisive act of yielding yourself. Yield yourself in a decisive act. In other words, brothers and sisters, to enter into the victory, it is important that there comes some time in your life when you see all that is involved in being crucified with Christ, at that time at least, maybe God will show you more in the future, but up to that time he shows you all the backlog of resistances against his will that you have had for years, and at that time you yield yourself to him in one act of full consecration. Now loved ones, I know you'll live in the light of that act from then on throughout your life, and I know that he'll give you more light as you move on with him, but do you see that Paul emphasizes that there is a time when you enter into this initially? And that that initial act is important. In other words, being delivered from the power of selfish anger and selfish jealousy and pride and irritability is not just a matter of thinking differently about yourselves. It isn't just a matter of thinking, oh, I'm crucified with Christ, so I have no right to do these things. Well, I just mustn't do them. I have no right. No, I'm dead. I'm dead. I'm dead. I know. And a dead man can't be irritable. And a dead man can't be impatient. It's not just a way of thinking about self that kind of takes from self the power of vehemence. It isn't loved ones. It is an actual initial yielding of yourself in full consecration to the death which Jesus died on the cross. And most of us who have entered into any experience of inward victory have had a time in our lives when we saw it all for the first time and we came to a point where we did yield ourselves definitely to God. Now, this is the same emphasis, you see, that you get in Paul in other places. Uh, if you like to look at uh, there are two separate places where he talks about it in Galatians uh, 2 and 19. And uh, even those of you who do not understand Greek will understand now from what I've explained that it is this aorist tense which is, means a thing took place at a definite time as opposed to the ordinary present tense that it's going on in the present. Galatians 2 and 19. And it's page 1013. Galatians 2 and 19. For I through the law died to the law. And the died is the aorist tense. I died at a certain time. At a certain moment I committed myself to the truth that God showed me that I had been crucified with Christ. And Colossians 3 and 3 is the same aorist tense. Colossians 3 and verse 3. But here God is talking about all of us. Galatians 3 and verse 3. For you, it's page 1027. 1027. And Galatians, uh, Colossians 3 and 3. For you have died and your life is hid with Christ in God. And it's that uh, emphasis of finality, you know. You have died, that's it. 
There came a time when you died. George Mueller said this. There came a day when I, George Mueller, died to self and died to sin. And I could testify to the same thing. That uh, I, I even happen to know the date. Uh, I have written it in a, in a certain book that, uh, that I, I know well. And uh, I happen to know the date when I came to the point where I said, I am willing to die, Lord. Now, dear ones, if you say to me, was there not a series of partial consecrations before you came to that moment? Yes, yes. There was a gradual process when I often thought that I had come to the ground of my heart. And I often thought that I was willing to die to self. But the anger the next day showed me I wasn't. Or the irritability a week later. So yes, there is a series of partial consecrations and partial surrenders. But there does come a time when the crisis takes place. Now maybe I should explain crisis. Not a big deal. Not a big emotional thing with thunder and lightning. No. Crisis in the sense of an end to the struggle. I know that death can often be a convulsive thing, depending on what a person dies of. But very often, death can just be a quiet slipping away to Jesus. And for me, that's what it was. It was just a quiet coming to the ground of my heart. No excitement, no emotion, no tongues, no great show, but just a quiet assurance that I had stopped breathing the inadequate air that I had been breathing for so long. That inadequate air of self. And so, loved ones, the initial act really is important. And I think a lot of us have real trouble with the day-to-day -day submission to the Holy Spirit because we did not complete the initial act. We really didn't. You know. We kept on saying, oh no, I don't want to seek an experience. And it's wrong to seek an experience. But I don't, want, I don't want something definite, at a definite point in my life. I just want to grow out of this gradually. Loved ones, cancer will grow with you if you feed it. The stuff has to be taken from you. You have to be delivered from it. You have to be healed of it. It has to be displaced by the healthy life of Jesus. And so many of us, I think, struggle eh, unsuccessfully with the business of daily submitting to the Holy Spirit. Because we do not complete the initial act of really dying to self at some point in our lives. And it's really the fullness of that consecration that enables the power of the Holy Spirit to come down upon us day by day. Now, that's important, you know. And whether you're going to, as Baptists, call it full consecration, or whether you're going to call it full surrender, or whether you're going to call it death to self, or whether you're going to call it coming into a place where you're ready to be baptized with the Holy Spirit, it doesn't really much matter. But it is important, loved ones, that you see that there comes a time when you count the cost of all that it's going to be to you. And you count what you're worth to yourself. And you count what you want out of life. And you look at all that the Holy Spirit has shown you. And you come to that place where you say, I'm willing to go. And then some of you may say, well, how do you ever come to that place? Well, not by introspection. I did it by asking the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, I have no idea what it means to be crucified with Christ. I have no notion of what it means that God destroyed me and Jesus on Calvary. I agree with the truth, but it's an intellectual idea in my mind. Holy Spirit, will you show me in what way I'm not willing to take part in that? And the Holy Spirit will give you revelation as to what way you're not willing to die. And then if you say to me, how do you know that you've come to that point of initial consecration, that full act, the Holy Spirit witnesses. If you said to me, what about all the other times you thought you'd come to the ground of your heart? There was always doubt. There was always uncertainty in me. I kind of thought, boy, that's a deep place that I've come to in surrendering to God. And I, maybe this is it. But when you come to that point, when you've reached the ground of your heart and dealt with all the resistances to God's will that have built up in the past and dealt with all that desire to be self and to be God and to have your own way, the Holy Spirit witnesses that you're at that point. And there's just a quiet assurance within you that you're ready to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. 
Now it's very important then, dear ones, to go on to what is the real topic for today, which is banking on God's life. It's very important to see that when you come to that place where you're willing to die to self with Jesus, that you do bank on the Holy Spirit coming through. Now, that's uh, what Paul is emphasizing in the second part of that verse, you see. Romans 6 and 13b. Romans 6 and 13b. You see, he, in the first part, in A, he says, Do not yield your members to sin as instruments of weakness, but yield yourselves to God as men who have been brought from death to life. So yield yourselves to God as men who have been brought from death to life. That's the initial consecration. And your members to God as instruments of righteousness. That is the day-to-day -day submission to the Holy Spirit. But making room for the Holy Spirit. Banking on the Holy Spirit coming through. In other words, it's vital to bank on being baptized with the Holy Spirit. Now, don't let's get all mixed up over baptism with the Holy Spirit. I don't mean tongues. Yes, tongues is one of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. But I mean that the Holy Spirit comes and fills you completely with himself. And from then on, you live regarding him as the master and the boss of your life. And you depend on him utterly and completely for guidance and for ability and grace. That, this baptism of the Holy Spirit in that sense. But loved ones, if you don't bank on that, then you'll go away from an act of full consecration that is very little better from the power of positive thinking. Do you see that? In other words, you'll go away having come to a place of full surrender, but not banking on the Holy Spirit. Not trusting the Holy Spirit. Not depending upon Him. And so, in fact, you won't move out into situations that He'll guide you into. So it's vital after coming to the place where you're willing to die with Christ to see that now God wants you to raise you with Jesus and wants you to put, to put you at his right hand. And you can see that position in Ephesians 2 and 6. Ephesians 2 and 6, it is, uh, it's about page 1017, 1017 in the black RSV. Ephesians 2 and 6. And you see, after God destroyed us in Jesus, verse 6 is true, and raised us up with him, and it's the past tense, raised us up with him, and made us sit with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Now it's vital, brothers and sisters, that you obey the guidance of the Holy Spirit when he wants to put you in situations that are viable only if he is available. In other words, if he wants you to walk around that silly old Jericho city, and you know full well that this is no way to have victory over the city, the way is to blow the walls out from under them, and you're parading round and round, if the Holy Spirit tells you to do that, then you must do it. It's vital to bank on the power of the Holy Spirit. It's vital to begin to put yourself out on a limb for God in situations that would not be bearable unless the Holy Spirit comes through. So, in a resentment situation, you resent that person because of what they've done to you and they haven't been fair and they've treated you unjustly and they've let you bear the whole burden of the finances or the work at home or the work in the apartment and you resent them. It's vital not only to come to a place where you die to your right to resent anybody, where you see that you were so bad yourself that God just destroyed you and you have no right to tell somebody else that they should treat you differently. And you come to that place where you're ready to die to self, it's, willing, it's, it's vital then to go forward to them and choose to love them and trust the Holy Spirit to fill you with love. In other words, it's vital to start banking on the power of the Holy Spirit to enable you to love them. Otherwise, what you do is, you stay back and you say, well, I can't love them, I don't feel love yet for them, well, I'll pray it up a bit and then I'll go and love them. No, you bank on the power of the Holy Spirit. You don't decide, Lord, when I feel power to knock down those walls, then I'll start walking around them. You'll never feel the power. You have to start walking around them first. And it's so with a resentment situation. You need to go into the situation and trust the Holy Spirit to fill you with love. You choose to love and God fills you with love. You act and God gives you the feeling. It's vital to begin banking on the Holy Spirit in a witnessing situation. If you hold back until you feel you're ready to speak, you'll never be ready to speak. You start going into situations banking on the Holy Spirit. And you go into the situation, go forward to the person, you open your mouth and trust God to fill it. But you make yourself available for God. Now, loved ones, 
That's what's involved in the positive side of the day-by-day submission to the Holy Spirit. It's vital to die to self in an initial act. It's vital day by day not to provide for sin. But it's vital also to provide for the power of the Holy Spirit, to bank on the power of the Holy Spirit. Tithing. I came through it myself. Uh, It was new to me, the idea of tithing. I, I know many of you have known it all your life, but I was a happy liberal Methodist, and we had the thing pretty well organized. And uh, so the idea of tithing, I couldn't believe that you actually were expected to give a tenth of your money to God. And gradually I got that through my head without the use of Hebrew or Greek, just understanding the English. And uh, then, then came the whole business, well, tithe. Well, I have to see if I can afford to tithe. And so I started to calculate whether I could afford to tithe. Dear ones, You bank on the power of the Holy Spirit, tithe first, calculate later. That's it. You tithe first and you calculate later. It's like that, you see. You really go out on limbs, banking on the power of the Holy Spirit to come through. And then, loved ones, you begin to find miracles happening. You begin to find that a sweet, fragrant life of Jesus is starting to come through you. And a life that seems not your own, And you begin to find that God is faithful and that he does, in fact, send the Spirit of his Son into you and pour the life of his Son through you. And really, the secret of it all is God has done all the acting already that is needed in Jesus. Now it's our turn to act. And that's why Christianity is really a very active thing. It's a real initial commitment to being crucified with Jesus. Not only a mental commitment, but a volitional commitment. And then it's a daily committing yourself into situations that are possible only if the Holy Spirit comes through for you. I don't want to, are there any questions just for even a minute? Yes. Sis sis says, is it possible to die to self over a period of time and years? And you can see that it's very important that even as I emphasize the completion of death, that I can understand that many of us will come into it in all kinds of different ways. And I know that. All I'm pleading is that if there are a series of near deaths, there must come a time when you stop breathing and when you're dead. And so all I'm pleading is that I can see that many of us have come to massive surrenders down through the years. I just think that there comes a time when you come to a real ground of your heart and you really know that you're living for Jesus' glory and for that only. But this, I, I'm, why I'm answering you that way instead of saying no is that a number of us, I think, use your words and we really mean that the final one of these series has been death. Whereas some of the rest of us say, is it possible to die gradually? And we mean we just die a little bit at a time, hoping that we'll get rid of anger today and envy tomorrow and jealousy the next day and impatience the next day. So it's vital to see that it is self that needs to be dealt with. And that, even though it may come through a series of near deaths, has to eventually come to a place of death. Yeah. Larry? That's good. I'm sorry. Thanks, Larry. Uh, sister really meant, uh, is, there more, <laughs> is there more light? Is there more light that you come into after being crucified with Christ? Yes. And if you say to me, is it a struggle and is it a death? No, it's a joyous entering into what your Father wants you to do. And that's what I would see as the difference. The Holy Spirit delivers you from resistance to God's will so that any further light is a beautiful, willing entering in. Yes. Glad you keep me right, Larry. I'm sorry (laughs) sorry dear ones Larry was sitting in front of her and he I think knows what she meant by death she meant on that she was referring to the death I'm just transferring it into light yes I'm just transferring it into light yeah in other words you can't call it deaths because it isn't an agonizing suffering thing it is more light God shows you more light I think I'm right, aren't I? Any more clear questions? <laughs> and I'll give an unclear answer. Uh, the question I thought I heard her ask was that if you can die, can you then have, have yourself 
I see. I see. I see. Oh, I, yeah. I think everything in Jesus surely is dependent on our faith. Surely we cannot say that we enter into anything that we can maintain apart from faith. Even those of us here this morning who would hold to the doctrine of eternal security would still believe that it is possible only because we continue to exercise faith. Yeah, I would think so, brother. That you could, you could, I think even Nee says that, uh, and I think he holds to eternal security, but he would say you begin to act as if you are not dead if you don't continue to exercise faith. Yes, brother. That poor girl. <laughs> Sis, they are wild, aren't they? <laughs> Sis, did I answer that question at all? Yes. <laughs> You'd say yes now just to get out of it. <laughs> I'd do the same. <laughs> Seems to me, loved ones, you know, it's possible to lose everything, isn't it? It's possible to lose all sense of our, the reality of our being in Jesus anyway. You know, if you hold to eternal security and hold that somehow you're still alive even though you don't feel like it, all right. But you certainly, all of us know that you can lose the reality of Jesus' presence as a perception in your spirit if you don't continue to abide in faith. And do want, I think we have to stay well clear of that old uh, holiness heresy that uh, there comes a time when you don't need to bother whether you're going to sin again or not. It seems to me we're not talking about that. That's dangerous. When you come to the place where you say, I can't sin. I can murder anybody even, but I can't sin. That's dangerous. Yeah. It seems to me everything is dependent upon our believing that we're crucified with Christ day by day. And our day by day submission to the Holy Spirit and our respect for him. Yeah. This is the first morning I felt I was Irish and couldn't understand American. <laughs> <laughs> Shall we pray? Dear Father, we thank you for your love of us and we thank you for the sense we have that we're a family, that it is possible to clarify things for each other and to all oh, just enjoy talking about you and about your truths. And Father, that it is an alive thing and something that is dynamic and active. And Father, we thank you for showing us this morning that no man or no woman can enclose in ordinary human words the truth of what you have achieved for us in Jesus. And we thank you that only the Holy Spirit can make all this real to us. And so, Holy Spirit, we would trust you to apply the truth of our death with Jesus to each one of us and our resurrection with him to the right hand of the Father so that each of us will come to that place where we really say yes. We're willing, Lord Jesus, for that to be made real in us. And Holy Spirit, we trust you to fill us with the life of the risen Son. And so, our Father, we trust you to enable us this coming week not to provide for sin in our lives, but to bank on the life of the Holy Spirit. For Jesus' glory. Amen.